All right, it's five o'clock. Welcome everyone to the Next in Equity series. I'm so grateful that Ty has been the facilitator for this equity series, and I'm going to turn it over to them. Yeah. Thank you, Stacey. And yeah, welcome to the Humboldt County Office of Education Equity Series. This installment, uh, we are going to talk about LGBT plus identity. Um, and the title of our event tonight is called Queering the Future in Education. And so like all of our equity series, we're going to start out with a land and labor acknowledgement. So as we gather here virtually this evening for the Equity Summit Series, we take a moment to acknowledge the land that we live and work on is the ancestral and present day indigenous land of the Wiat people. Many other indigenous nations also call this place their home, including Hoopa, Karuk, Matol, Tolawa, Wailaki, and Yurok peoples. The economic, political, and cultural wealth of this country as we know it today was built on the backs of enslaved Africans who endured human trafficking, slavery, as well as present day systemic violence. We owe the progress of this society to the unacknowledged continual labor of black and indigenous people of color from immigrant labor, undocumented labor, trafficked and untrafficked, as well as women of all races and ethnicities whose labor is not always recognized and is systemically undervalued. So we live in a matrix of oppression that pits us against each other to maintain a hierarchy of power our liberation from racism and settler colonialism is directly tied to our liberation from heterosexism and cis sexism. Queer liberation cannot happen off the backs of our black and brown siblings, but in conjunction and collaboration with movements towards racial equity and social justice. And so another part of our land acknowledgement is thinking about actionable steps we can take um, not only to just say our land acknowledgements, but the things that we might be able to do to work towards um, equity for us, basically. And so some of the things that we talk about is the honor tax. Uh, you can donate any amount of money and um, it's greatly appreciated. Um, another actionable step is to contribute and interact with organizations that are doing the work in your community. And hopefully after this um, event, we can also have or get our gears turning in terms of what other actual steps we might be able to take. So welcome. Uh, my name is Ty Parker. I use they them pronouns and I'm also the board president of Queer Humble and I will be your facilitator this evening. Um, I'm also a counselor in the community and I have a, uh, a special interest in queering social justice. And so that's why I'm here today. So before we begin, I really wanted to show this short clip. It's um, from a organization named Canvas, and they're really doing some great work in terms of having more inclusive, LGBT inclusive spaces for uh, school and organizations around school. There were a lot of mirrors at my school. I don't remember seeing myself, not in textbooks, or in chalkboards, or in the tips of teachers' tongues. I wasn't talked about here. An unspoken character in a room of protagonists, I wondered why no one could tell us how to define ourselves, or accept the truth in others. A decade passes, though, and I get to speak out about it. A canvas facilitator, a living looking glass, and when I visit schools, I see younger me's, growing beings who look at me with wide eyes and burning questions. Working with canvas means the landscape is ours to paint, in the color of compassion, in the shade of change. You know, a gay 12 year old once told me that harming herself was the only way. And a trans 14 year old once told me that their only wish in the world was just to be called they. We didn't have rainbow flags in our hallways, but we knew what fear felt like. We knew what we wanted to learn when there was no one there to teach it. Well, now we're here. Let's use art to spark curiosity, tell stories that build empathy, learn pronouns for all genders, 
I want to teach you how to turn that's so gay into a compliment. Use markers to draw blueprints for gender neutral bathrooms. Tell boys that pink is not a bad color. Teach girls how to lift up each other. We paint our message on every locker, in every single color. This is about you, your children, your grandchildren, your grandchildren's friends. We all just want to feel like it is okay to exist. When they see me in their classroom, all queer, all grown, our reflections aren't so different. But this time, they are visible. This time, they are beautiful. They say, I want a better earth, to be accepted and respected. This knowledge is power. It lets us recognize our true selves. I am transgender, and because of this workshop, I know that there are students like me out there. And so I want to acknowledge that um, just like two-spirit LGBTQ plus um, is a gigantic topic and we're only scratching the surface of talking about, you know, queering education. Um, this is really a lifelong journey in terms of learning. Uh, and I think that when we're talking about LGBT, you know, identity experience, as well as resistance, we can't simply talk about it for an hour and a half and consider ourselves, you know, done or competent in these areas. Uh, it's really a ongoing conversation, especially since for a lot of LGBT folks, um, our lives, our love and our longevity are at stake. So we have some amazing folks here tonight that are, um, you know, courageous and vulnerable enough to talk about their experiences. Uh, as well as an amazing keynote that we're gonna hear from not only talking about their experience as queer folk, but also more locally here in Humboldt. And so now without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote, the fabulous Nora Wynn, uh, who is also awarded the 2021 California State Teacher of the Year. And so before that, we would like to um, take a poll just to see who all is attending so we can get a, a little bit more of a gauge of who all is here. So if you could please fill that out. And so when folks are filling out that uh, poll, we'd also like you to um, go up to your right hand corner if you if this isn't already a setting and click on your view. Uh, so you're going to go to speaker so that when Nora speaks, uh, she is the only video that folks see. And I'll just give this a few more seconds. So can folks see the, the polling results? All right, cool. So it looks like we have a lot of teachers and educators as well as uh, support folks and community members. Oop, look at that. And we got some students here as well. So thank you all for attending. Oh, I'll stop sharing that. Thanks, Ty. Yeah, and uh, so right before Nora gives her presentation, I'll just do a little intro. Uh, so Nora Wynn teaches Spanish at McKinleyville Middle School, is the emerging, oh, so sorry, immersion, immersion coordinator for the Spanish Immersion Schools in McKinleyville, and is an instructional coach for the MUSD. She has been teaching since 1997 and has taught sixth through 12th grades. She has taught in the Humboldt State University's School of Education program since 2000 and completed her MA in education in 2008. Uh, in multicultural education with a focus on racism and homophobia in teacher preparation. She also teaches gay and lesbian issues in K through 12 schools in the Department of Critical Race, Gender and Sexuality Studies. And again, she is 
the 2021 California State Teacher of the Year. And so I'll pass it over to Nora now. Thanks, Ty. The sound just went out for me. I don't know if you can give me a thumbs up if you can hear. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, I spend my day doing that kind of thing with my students. <laughs> so I appreciate the, the quick feedback. Thanks for the introduction, Ty. And, and before I begin, I want to acknowledge that all of the people who have been so instrumental in putting this series together, it's been fantastic and I'm, I'm so honored to be a part of it. So I identify as white and queer and I use she, her pronouns, but I get called sir a lot. And so I answered to that too. <laughs> um, I teach middle school Spanish at McKinleyville Middle School and I teach future teachers at Humboldt State University. And I grew up playing smear the queer and getting called a sissy. If I cried or if I showed any weakness, I was told I throw like a girl. And I understood that um, gay, to be gay meant to be less than and to be weak and to be hated. And I breathed in all of that homophobic smog and uh, I was surrounded by it and how could I not? But at some point in my early 20s, I stumbled on the fantastic Alison Bechdel's comic strip, Dykes to Watch Out For. And I kissed a girl and I found my way to Humboldt State University in the early 90s where Carlisle Douglas was teaching a class called Lesbian Studies. Most of the students in the class didn't register for the course because at that time, it was a liability to have the word lesbian on your transcripts. And I tell you this for a bit of background and to note that it's no small feat to feel proud of who I am. I'm proud to be a gay person, a queer person, and I don't mean like in a general way, like in a pride parade kind of way, um, where capitalism gets to use gay people to sell products with rainbow flags on it. I mean to say that I'm deeply grateful to be queer and I feel like it's one of my best attributes. And I say this at the outset, not only in response to the fact that I live in a world where I get constant messages that being queer is a negative, and where laws change regularly to regulate me and my family, and where people are fired and beaten and killed for being like me. I say this to mean that being gay is one part of my identity that gives me knowledge and insight and joy that I wouldn't get to experience as a non-queer person. My mentor and friend, Eric Rofus, saw his gender performance and sexuality as an act of resistance. He writes, in a world where homosexuality was not spoken about and derided, I made the decision to love men. And while some may see this as a gay gene or an act of self-destruction, I see it as a profound act of courage and rebellion. Becoming queer was the best thing I ever did for myself. And I'm with Eric. Being queer has allowed me to understand structural and institutional racism. Being queer has allowed me to understand cultural representation and how it can make us believe things about ourselves that we know to be false. Being queer, queer has allowed me to have a deeper capacity for empathy. And being queer has allowed me to become an advocate for people on the margins. Being queer has allowed me to love deeply. And I'm grateful to be gay and I know that I have a strong community of queer and non-queer allies, but I also live in a world where some people hate me for being queer. Some people pretend that they don't know that about me and others simply act as if it's not an important part of me. So I wanna give a shout out to all the fabulous queer people here tonight. I see you and I celebrate you. And I also wanna acknowledge all of the teachers who have already worked all day trying to meet the wild and beautiful needs of their students. Teaching is an honorable profession. It's never ending. The job asks more of us than is reasonable, more than is doable. And teaching is an impossible task. Yet many of you here tonight did it all day, all week, all year on Zoom and in the classroom, sometimes simultaneously. And I honor your work, your commitment, your sacrifice for your students and your sacrifice to be here tonight after a long day of work. I see you. So thanks for being here. I'm really honored to be with you all for the Humboldt County Office of, Ed, Edu um, Office of Education Equity Series as a keynote speaker with a theme of queering the future of education. And as I began to write this address, I wondered what do I have to offer? All of you have your own experiences and there are plenty of you here tonight who may have the same ideas as I do or even better ones. And I realize that all of us can have some time and benefit from some time for reflection to consider how we're doing and how we can do better. So that's what I hope to offer tonight. Some time for us to look at the state of education through a queer lens 
And in order to do this, it seems that we have to adjust our lens and refocus on what it might mean to teach toward a queer future. Let's start with the state of classrooms and hallways that my students and I spend time in every day. The GLSEN, uh, Gay, Lesbian, Straight Educators Network, Network School Climate Report surveys students across the country and comes out every two years. It takes the pulse for LGBTQ students in America's schools. And in 2019, the most recent one, 92% of LGBTQ students reported that they heard negative remarks about gender expression, like not ask, acting masculine enough or feminine enough regularly at school. And 95% of LGBTQ students heard other type of homophobic remarks like dyke or faggot. And 97% of LGBTQ students heard the phrase no homo at school, as in when a guy hugs another guy and then says no homo. And 99% of students reported that they heard gay used in a negative way, as in that's so gay at school. So I've watched this data for a decade and a half and it gets better, but ever so slightly and so slowly. But still, 68% of students reported getting threatened at school. They get touched and groped and physically assaulted. And almost half of the students report that they avoid the restrooms because they feel unsafe there. They avoid crowded hallways. They get dressed in layers so as to skip changing clothes in the locker rooms. They avoid school functions and they even avoid school. Lesbian, gay, bisexual kids are five times more likely to have attempted suicide than their non-queer peers. And remember, suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people from 10 to 24 years old. And 40% of trans adults report that they have attempted suicide, most of them, 92% of them, before the age of 25. Beyond all of this overt danger, there are the cumulative daily harms done that may seem small, but over time create an uninhabitable situation. Students report that they're prevented from using the restroom they feel most comfortable in, prevented from wearing the clothing that they feel most comfortable in, prevented from using the pronoun or the name they prefer. They're prevented from attending the dance with the partner of their choice, from choosing the research topic of their choice, from speaking out about an issue that they're passionate about. And of course, even though the research is there, I probably don't need to tell you that rural queer kids get less support have fewer resources and face more hostile school climates than urban schools, or that students in middle school report higher rates of biased language, victimization, and discriminatory practices than students in high school. They have fewer GSAs, fewer support staff, and it's probably easy to deduce that our Black and our Indigenous and other students of color, that students with disabilities and students whose first language isn't English suffer more. Of course, we're all made up of multiple identities at once. And each of us has a gender and an ethnicity and a language and a culture and so much more. And when we look carefully at each student and their intersecting identities, it's obvious that some people, some young people are so much more at risk than others. And when we think about this, I'm often reminded of Sheree Moraga, who reminds us when we consider the oppressive forces upon us, that the danger lies in the failure to acknowledge the specificity of the oppression. I just want to repeat that the danger lies in the failure to acknowledge the specificity of the oppression. And one of the specificities of the LGBTQ student experience that differs from other marginalized youth is that queer youth are often living without positive role, model, role models in their homes. LGBTQ kids are often raised by our oppressors. Many parents reject their child's identity as it develops and LGBTQ children are told that they're not normal and that they're experiencing a phase or, or that they're sinful. Often queer youth are kicked out of the house for their gender expression or sexual identity. It's estimated that youth who identify as LGBTQ make up 40% of unaccompanied homeless youth. LGBTQ students who experience such victimization, of course, miss more days of school. They lack a sense of belonging. They report lower self-esteem. They report more depression. They're more at risk for sexually risk behavior, risky behavior, higher dropout rates. Of course, can we call it a dropout if they're really pushed out? Which obviously leads them to have uh, pursue higher education less often. And the last bit of data I want to provide you with is about teacher responses. More than half of LGBTQ students who are harassed or, assault, or assaulted at school didn't report the incident to school staff. Most commonly because they doubted that effective intervention would occur. 
or that the situation would become worse if they reported it. And 60% of students who did report said the staff did nothing. So the message is clear to our queer students, don't report it, it won't get better and it might get worse. And as much as I'll be an advocate for teachers and for the profession, nothing makes me sadder than the next statistics. 52% of students reported hearing homophobic remarks from teachers or other school staff. In a recent report on teachers, Glisson noted that 50% of teachers are doing at least one LGBTQ and gender inclusive practice, including intervening on behalf of their queer students. And this is a statistic that on its face might not be easy to interpret. But consider that half of your staff are providing what students need sometimes. Who are those teachers? And more importantly, who are the other 50%? And why are they not in using inclusive practices? Research on this topic, including my own for my master's at Humboldt State, shows that teachers face a number of barriers. Queer teachers feel like they'll be in jeopardy in several ways if they include LGBTQ topics or intervene, or intervene when heterosexist or homophobic incidents occur. They feel that they'll get homophobic backlash from students, from their colleagues, from parents, and even from their administrators. And they also fear losing their jobs. Non-queer teachers cite that they fear getting it wrong, that they cite fear of their administration won't back them up if there's backlash, and their own beliefs prevent them from engaging in LGBTQ and gender inclusive practices. Additionally, my research and other studies find that many teachers believe that their students are too young for LGBTQ content or that it doesn't fit into the curriculum. Internalized homophobia is strong. I know that statistics can feel numbing. And so if you've been zoning out while well, I've been giving you statistics, here's a couple of uh, little brief stories, uh, vignettes from my research here locally. Juan told me that he was headed to math class one day when he saw a poster on the wall for his GSA and it was defaced with bad words and it was ripped apart. And he said it felt violent and he couldn't concentrate on math when he got to class. Theo, a student teacher told me that a high school student made a homophobic joke in class. Several kids chuckled, a few looked uncomfortable and the mentor didn't respond. And so Theo felt uncomfortable addressing the situation that the mentor let slide. Theo told me that he replays that scene over and over and knows he should have responded. Natalia told me that her teacher read the bulletin to the class one day and announced that there was a meeting at lunch for a club for LGBTQ kids called the Diversity Club. And she was kind of interested in going. After reading it, the teacher made a joke about all of the diversity here with air quotes. And Natalia, who identifies as native and bisexual, said she felt invisible and she lost respect for him after that. Heather told me that she had a good and fun rapport with the office ladies where she was a TA. She shared that she began to feel uncomfortable lately because they were constantly asking her about her boyfriend when she actually had a crush on a girl in her class. She felt the need to lie to them and this made her stressed. Lee, who is gender nonconforming, gets harassed in the girl's restroom. She decides to hold it and stop using the restrooms on campus. She walks, uh, at lunch she walks to the frozen yogurt shop nearby to use the restroom. She arrives late back to campus and gets tardies in her fifth period class and the tardies add up to lower her grade. Lulu, who is five, and all of the girls are playing the wedding on the playground when one of the girls she is playing with tells her that she has to be the man because girls can't marry girls. And even though Lulu's moms are married, she doesn't say anything. Lance, who is identified, who identified to me as gender fluid, told me about a debate in his high school English class around the time of the Supreme Court decision about gay marriage. He described how the debate around marriage quickly turned to religion and then whether being gay is right or wrong. He felt silenced and wrong and didn't wanna go back to that class. And Julie, a first grade teacher told me that she thought her first grade students were too young to read a book about Harvey Milk because she thought it might conf confuse kids about romantic feelings. So these are local people who have told me these stories over the years. And although these statistics and these stories might seem dire, I don't want you to feel that queer kids are only victims. There are so many examples of queer kids who rise up and harness these experiences and their power and go out into the world to make change. But these students carry the weight of the school's responsibilities and other institutions whose job it is to keep kids safe. 
Consider this, many of our queer students are the reasons that any adult on campus has become a GSA advisor, a Gay Straight Alliance advisor. Ask most GSA advisors and they'll tell you that the club depends on a strong student leader for the club to thrive and in, in some cases even exist. So what can I do? I've been asked this question from time to time by colleagues or leaders in schools, usually in the aftermath of a homophobic incident. And there are several things that help LGBTQ youth thrive in our schools and in life. LGBTQ and gender inclusive practices make a positive difference for queer students, but also make a difference for all students. LGBTQ and gender inclusive practices increase a sense of safety and belonging and raise self-esteem and raise GPAs and raise graduation rates. And they reduce homophobic language and harassment, which in turn reduces dropout rates and depression and suicide. LGBTQ and gender inclusive policies allow students to use bathrooms and locker rooms more comfortably and helps them feel affirmed. So here are just a few ideas for a better future for LGBTQ kids in schools. Number one, queer your view of our educational systems. And by that, I mean, let's look at our educational outcomes and ask, for whom is this system working? What percentage of our students who are living in poverty what percentage of our students who are black and brown? What percentage of our emergent bilingual students? What percentage of our indigenous youth? And what percentage of our students with disabilities are finding success in the system as it is currently? Who's thriving? Let's take advantage of this crisis that COVID has offered us to make real change. Let's leave behind the one size fits all school model. We need to ask more of our educational systems and of our leaders. Schools should be sites of liberation rather than sites of colonization. Let's demand a well-funded educational system that's not one that our, sim our students simply survive and then recover from, but instead that allows all children to maintain their dignity and become critical thinkers who feel loved and valued. Each child should, spend, should get to spend their day with a caring, well-trained, well-compensated adults who have their full development in mind, don't you think? Number two, queer your curriculum. We know that cultural representation matters. We know that students who see themselves in the curriculum can imagine themselves in the world beyond school. When we include the value that queer people have added to our society, all of our students benefit. When we hide their contributions, we all lose. Often my students at HSU tell me that they don't know anything about our queer foremothers and forefathers and queer pathmakers. They don't know the names of Harry Hay, Phyllis Lyon, Del Martin, Marsha P. Johnson, and Sylvia Rivera. They tell me that they never, in fact, have heard a teacher openly talk about gay people unless it's a current event, like a murder or a trial or a first. When we talk about their education, they tell me that they've heard of Sally Ride, for example, in science class, but not that she was married to a woman. They may have read the poetry of Garcia Lorca in Spanish class, but not known of his homosexuality. They may have studied the art of Frida Kahlo, but not learned that she had relationships with women. They may have learned of Martin Luther King Jr.'s March on Washington, but not that he hid the organizer, Bayard Rustin, because he was gay. Imagine that we didn't erase this part of these great artists, scientists, organizers, and writers. Imagine instead that we highlighted this aspect of their lives. Imagine that we taught the civil rights movement and included the man who introduced King to the ideas of nonviolence and told how he was fired because he was gay and hidden from the public eye. Imagine how much students might understand the complexities of intersectional oppression. Imagine how this lesson alone could help students understand the connection between racism, sexism, homophobia, and other oppressions. Number three, queer your staff. Search for LGBTQ teachers, counselors, administration, and staff. If you widen your search and you can't find enough queer people to apply, add a question to the interviews to assess the attitudes of, about LGBTQ people and experiences. When you hire queer people, support them. Have their back when they experience homophobia from parents, community, and yes, even from students. Recognize that they have survived a lifetime of microaggressions due to their identity and that students' aggression toward them still hurts. See your staff's queer identity as an asset to your school community. Recognize that if you have out queer staff, they are survivors and that their resilience will be an example to others. If you have staff who are still in the closet, ask yourself, what about your school keeps them there?
Number four, queer your library. Go to your school library and do an audit. Find your books that have queer authors and queer characters and put them out on display so that your queer students and everybody else don't have to dig around in the, in the dark back corner. If you can't find them, go to the many websites that are gathering titles of books where gay people are not the victim, but rather the hero, the queero. Put those books on your shelves. My HSU students report that they've never read a book with a queer character in it when they were in K-12 schools, and they can't name a gay author, and they've never had a book read to them when they were little that included gay characters. Number five, queer your policies. LGBTQ and gender inclusive policies would allow kids to use the restrooms where they feel comfortable, make sure that dress codes don't limit gender expression, would make forms that don't have that have non binary options and pronoun options. We're obsessed with the binary at schools, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, K eight teachers still regularly line students up into two lines, boys and girls. How about three lines? How about we use some other arbitrary category like do you like crunchy or creamy peanut butter? We could pick anything. Number six, queer your culture. Educate staff about LGBTQ issues. Educate your bus drivers, your cafeteria staff, your front office folks, the playground monitors. Create a culture that encourages staff to celebrate queer and non-binary folks. Create the norm to never let slide the homophobic comment, the transphobic comment, the attack on someone's identity. Make gay families welcome. Include the rich diversity of people represented on the walls of the classroom. Look around, see who's missing from your walls and add them there. Number seven, support queer kids specifically related to their queer experiences and celebrate their identity. Educate yourself about their experiences of your campus, their outside support network, their friends. Consider the other parts of their identity that puts them more at risk. Listen carefully. Ask them about what it's like for them. Ask them what would help. Help them start a GSA. Serve as their advisor for the GSA. Support students one-on-one -on -one and be ready if they come out to you. Honor their pronoun. Model using the right pronoun for colleagues when they misgender a student. Connect queer students with mentors who can support them. Connect queer students to community organizations. Invite queer guests to work with kids on your campuses. These are only seven of many ideas that I can think of to move us forward to queer liberation. And I'm sure you can come up with more. I highlight these because they are simple, within your budget and within your reach. I'm an out queer teacher in a small rural town. Representation matters. Young queer people don't have role models of queer teachers. 40 years ago, I didn't have any openly queer teachers. And 20 years ago, I couldn't be one in my first job here in Humboldt County. Today, ask yourselves, how many out queer teachers has your child had in their K-12 experience? Probably not many. This isn't by chance. The systematic silencing and punishment of people on the margins maintains the status quo. Without a voice, without representation, young queer people don't imagine themselves in important roles in our world, and we're robbed of their brilliance. When students see someone like themselves being held up as an example, they imagine how they too might go out into the world and thrive. My very existence at McKinleyville Middle School is an example of active resistance. My commitment to public education and to my students has helped me endure when all other signs have told me that I don't belong. I'm still in the classroom because of my fiercely held belief that in a democracy, public schools are sites where everyone should be welcomed exactly as they are and supported to reach their full potential. Schools are the democratic institutions that force us all together. When we leave school, we get to choose who we want to be with and who we want to stay away from. Imagine that we taught kids to understand that diversity is a powerful component to our society. Imagine that we move beyond bully prevention and move towards celebration of our kids' identities. Imagine that we take a brave and sensible stance and ground all of our curriculum in the skills that students need to participate in our democracy, including how to value differences. Homophobia doesn't only hurt gay people. If you teach in elementary schools, you could practically see the moment that the gender police come along and teach boys that they can't hug and they can't cry and they can't touch or comfort their buddy lest they be seen as homo. Imagine that we create a society that loves queer people enough to hope that our young people grow up to be queer. 
If you're a parent, imagine hoping that your kid grows up to be trans. If you're a teacher, imagine that you hope your students grow up to be gay, lesbian, or bisexual. This might seem hard for some of you to imagine. And if that's the case, I wanna remind you of all the things that being queer has allowed me. It's taught me all kinds of great things. It's given me gifts, compassion, empathy, strength, knowledge, courage, joy, and love. Imagine that we love our kids enough to open the doors for them, that we love them enough so much they can love themselves. Imagine that we love them enough to be free from the old binaries and arbitrary divisions that keep us apart. Imagine the possibilities for their future if we can do this. Thanks. Thank you, Nora, for that. I think it's really important to not only share those statistics, but also recognizing the joy in queer existence. So thank you. So in moving forward, the theme of this equity series uh, of 2021 is intersections of student-centered equity and interrupting colonial practices. So I think it's really important as people working towards equity that we listen to those most affected um, by issues at hand. And so we're going to hear from some students as well as educators locally regarding their perspectives and experiences as queer folks living and working in Humboldt. Before we begin the student panel, I would like to say that um, all speakers tonight have been offered an honorarium in acknowledgement for their queer knowledge and labor tonight. Uh, these folks are speaking about their lived experiences, which takes a lot of vulnerability and courage. Um, and so uh, a lovely person is here with us tonight, Live Ampudia from Two Feathers Native American Family Services who hasn't um, just supported this student panel tonight, but has supported three of the equity series student panels. So I just wanted to recognize her for a moment. And I also wanted to share some of the, the backroom admin stuff of how we do these things, because I think it really exemplifies how we can care and honor and support communities that are marginalized, especially if they are our own. And now we are going to move to the student panel. So, um, I request that anyone that is not on the student panel to stop their video so that we can only see um, the folks on the student panel. All right. And so we're gonna introduce ourselves just real quickly. Um, Zoe, would you like to go first with a quick intro? Oh. All right. Hi, I am so sorry. Um, there's some really loud outside my window. Um, hi, um, I'm Zoe. I'm a sophomore at Eureka High. I use she, they pronouns. Um, I'm part of the GSA there, the Youth Educating Against Homophobia um, Club. Um, I've been in there for two years now, since freshman year. Um, All right, thank you. Anita, would you go next? Hi, my name's Anita. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a senior at Humboldt State University, and I am proud to say I'm a student of Nora. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Ramel, would you like to go next? Hi, my name is Ramel, you say them pronouns. I'm actually a transfer student. So this was like my first like year at HSU. I am also a student of Nora Winnie and thank you for having me. Nice. All right, thanks for being here. Alex, would you like to go next? Hi guys. Um, I'm Alex. I use he, him pronouns. I identify as an American, Asian American, queer, trans man. Um, I'm a senior, so I'm graduating this uh, spring, and I'm also in Nora's uh, 318 class. Nice. Well, congratulations on graduation in the future, and thank you all for being here. So we're going to start off the panel with our first question. When was the first time you were exposed to two-spirit LGBTQIA plus history, events, 
or people in school? And how is that portrayed? So I'll just open the floor to anyone who'd like to begin. Um, I can go first, break the ice, why don't I? Um, I think to answer this question, people were introducing queer stuff to me first because as a way to like make fun of me, people were like, oh, you act like this person, you act like this person. I don't know who any of these people are. I don't even know what gay is at this point. I'm like in middle school. So then I'm just looking up all these people. I'm like, wow, the only correlation is that they're rich. So like for a long time, I thought I couldn't be queer unless I was rich. <laughs> so when people ask me, am I, am, was I like queer? I'm like, no, cause like I'm broke. <laughs> I, I have no money. How can I be queer? Cause all these people are living in fancy houses and all that. I was like, can't be me, can't be me. <laughs> I can go next. Um, I wasn't really exposed to any of that just because it was something that like no one really talked about in my neighborhood. I'm from San Diego, by the way. Um, and there's like mostly black and brown kids. So we didn't really talk about that. That's not something that we talk about in my community, at least. Um, it wasn't until high school where I had my first queer teacher, but like it wasn't, she wasn't like super open about it. And like I knew because I would like not leave her alone. Like as soon as I saw her, I was like attached her at the hip. It was probably super annoying for her, but it was awesome. And as a senior in college, it's the first, like I'm in my first class with Nora where like I've actually learned about like two-spirit LGBTQ plus like history. And it's like not even the subject of the class, but it's still something that I'm learning. And I think that's awesome. And I can go next. I'm from uh, Orange County. So I went to a high school that was predominantly white. Um, and the majority of the association with everything was through rumors. And then eventually, because at the time I identified, um, I came out, I was like a lesbian and I was a girl. Um, basically like I started becoming a part of the rumors and like there was a lot of negative association with that. But I mean, also on the flip side, I think being marginalized in high school also provided me with like a smaller queer community, like of like me and my queer friends. And we were, it felt like it was like living resistance, which was cool, but also still had all the bullying and all that good stuff too. Um, my first experiences in school with um, LGBT anything, I think were also like um, teachers that um, I, I was pretty like open about it, like in middle school, especially. And um, I found out like, I guess some of my teachers were also um, queer through that. And yeah, that's, that's about three. Nice, thank you. So it sounds like uh, for some, it was an introduction by peers and for others, maybe not until a little bit later, sorry, later, or by, you know, teachers that were queer. Cool, thank you. So the next question is, do you feel safe in school, work, or home, as well as your wider community in regards to your sexual orientation or gender identity? And has this always been the case? I'll go first. <laughs> um, so when I came, I came out like junior year of high school, and um, the high school that I went to, it was like a little whiter, whiter than what I grew up in the schools that I grew up in for elementary. And so I felt like I was like pretty accepted there. And I was like really grateful and really privileged to be able to just like, like I came out and I was able to express myself the way I wanted to. And it really set the stone for like who I am now and how like comfortable I feel. But like, there's also a difference in terms of like how I like, present myself with friends versus like my family there's still a difference and I also will say that I feel I do feel more accepted when I'm with my friends who are black and brown than I do with my white friends well I don't really have that many white friends but there's a difference there's a difference you could tell um and yeah I can go after that um I think safety wise um, I'll split it into like how I felt in high school and how I feel I'm like humble. But in high school, it like it was kind of more like offhand comments. So I never felt like I was like at risk of being hurt, but rather just like it was like 
the loose teasing and stuff like that that kind of went by. The only time I really felt super unprotected was we had proctors on campus, like the people would like monitor and like just like watch us at lunch, I guess. And we, me and my partner at the time, like we were like just leaning against each other and they were like, you can't do that. And obviously there's like a heterosexual couple like right over there, like all on each other. And there was like that big difference. And I remember going to a GSA advisor about it and it was like a new GSA advisor. And she said like, there was nothing we could do about it or like we should let it go. And like, that's what I mean is I think like with education, like it's in, in a lot of educators, like it was clear to me even back then that like we were kind of behind still like and like the support I needed then wasn't like there. And then when I came to Humboldt, like everything was a lot more open. I think the real safety issues only kind of stemmed from when I stepped off of like outside of campus. Like if I was at Target and like I was with like I'm friends with majority like people of color sometimes or like, you know, and I don't know, those comments, like, because I'm a person of color, I think it added to that. Or like when I would go to the bathroom, like in the guy's bathroom, like there's obviously like tensions there for me still, um, but that's kind of where I'm at now. Nice, thank you for sharing that, Alex. I think it's super important, um, both what Anita and Alex said in terms of like, it's sounding like we code switch sometimes to protect ourselves depending on the group of people that we're with, be it our home, our friends, work, school. And yeah, what Alex was saying also in terms of the policing that happens to queer folks, um, when that policing isn't the same for, you know, people that fall under the normative categories. So thanks for that. Romel and Zoe, uh, wondering what your thoughts on the topic were. Yeah. Um... I'd say I was a lot like I was a lot louder about my identity in middle school when I was <laughs> kind of finally more sure of it. But um, I'd say that I never really felt too unsafe because I had a large group of people that were also like very queer. <laughs> so yeah, I yeah I didn't feel unsafe and like I didn't really experience any like direct harassment. But I think that like if anything was like happening it was like kind of not it wasn't like to us it was more like behind it, like anyone's like bags maybe like whispers or something it like yeah i don't think in any school that i've been in there's been a lot of like to me at least like not like direct bullying it's more like um i think uh the difference for me was um, so prior to coming to Humboldt, I lived um, in, you know, the Bay Area, which, you know, you would think it's like a, you know, everything, because we're right, like, next San Francisco, everything's, like, all queer friendly and everything. But, no, I think, like, the biggest challenge I had to deal with, like, student athletes, especially because, like, in a lot of my PE classes, I had a lot of them in there. So I'd be like changing in the bathrooms and then like all of a sudden I just look up and then like someone's yelling at me cause like I'm obviously very feminine, very gay at this point in my life. It was like, at this point it was whatever. And so like, I turned into like a firecracker to make sure no one would like try me if lack for a better word. So like I spent a lot of my time in the office like for basically defending myself, not physically, but like verbally because I just, I felt like if I was like gonna be like the out person at my school that everyone knew about, then I was gonna be the out person nobody knew not to mess with or that people could come to to support. So I took that role onto myself. And it wasn't until like coming to Humboldt and like being in an environment that was like so different, that was like not constantly like making me feel like an outsider. I kind of like chilled out and like learned that my personality isn't exactly like full-blown firecracker ready to fight everybody at every time but it's also like I can do it but I'm just more like calm and at peace here mostly because more people understand that like my queerness should not be affected as me as my personality at the same time you should my me and my queerness are two different things that intersect from time to time but it's not who I am and it took a long time for like me to find a place that made me feel that way Nice, thank you. I think it's really important to point out what Zoe was saying as well in terms of her feeling safe. And it sounds like 
one of the reasons is because she has a lot of friends around her that are also supportive and inclusive. And I think it's also important what Romel said as well in terms of, again, he was saying he was policed differently um, for standing up for himself, basically. All right, so we're gonna go to the next question. What do you see um, in the future in terms of our title, queering the future of education, or what would you wanna see happen for schools or for administrators or staff? I can go first on this one. Um, I think like what I was at, towards the end of Nora's speech when she was saying like, imagine a future where we actually support queer kids and like we want our kids to be queer. Um, I thought a lot, I was like reflecting a lot about my high school experience and how I'm grateful for the queer community that I created during high school, but I can't imagine what it would have been like if we weren't so worried about like surviving and just like supporting each other emotionally. And we, we actually began kind of this like mobility and like actual progression of um, kind of understanding like the LGBT like issues that were at hand. Because I think in high school, it was so focused on just trying to survive the identity that you held. Um, and I think for the future, I wish all that queer labor wasn't spent on just trying to like accept yourself and that like we could get to this point where that was like, or that it was supported and that we can actually kind of, I, I don't know. I just know queer kids are very powerful. And when we put our minds to something, we can definitely get it done. And I think it, um, with a lot of like the certain like transgender policies that I'm seeing and like the bills that are being proposed, like that type of stuff makes me really sad. And I think to get queer kids to a point where they're appreciated that we can mobilize and make sure those bills never even get proposed in the first place or something like that. Like, that would be super awesome in the future. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like imagining the amazing things that we could do if we didn't have to spend all our energy basically surviving. And I do wanna also acknowledge, I, I accidentally mis misgendered you, Romel, so I'm really sorry about that. All right. I, I want to second um, what Alex is saying. I want to see definitely more like celebrations and more, it's hard, obviously it's hard and it's not going to happen for a minute, but hopefully we could just have more conversations and more mobility on like just stuff that isn't sad and stuff that we had to go through, you know? And I think we're seeing that like in present day, we're seeing more communities celebrate and like be more accepting. It's just, it has to be more. And I definitely want to see more just more people getting hired and more people getting money and more money towards like, yeah, celebrating queer joy and like more money towards queer conversations, um, people of color who are queer, jobs, job or jobs for people of color who are queer because it is still very whitewashed and all my teachers who were queer were all white. Like I have yet to have a queer faculty of color so I'm excited for whenever that happens to me, maybe in my master's, or maybe I'll be the first one. But yeah, we'll see. So just more money, more celebration. That's what I want to see in our future for our people. I want to see representation, like in both media, books, like chat, like whatever you make us assign, like just more representation because I can't tell you the amount of times like that probably would have like strengthened my like my will to keep pushing forward if I just saw there were more queer people that existed outside of like this lens of like high classism like if I just saw queer people living if I just saw queer people who are like in their 30s or 40s just living their life I would have felt like so like much better about my queerness and I really do wish that um more children just had that like in their like the back of their mind like I can grow up to be 30 and have a professional job and not have to be someone who's rich and that's the only way I can survive no I can be queer and be a therapist I can be queer and be a teacher and just live my life like a regular human being without this aspect of worrying about will I get bullied if I go to school will I get like why I get physically harmed if I go to school. And it's just, it's like Alex said, it's like, imagine the potential someone could have had prior to being bullied 
for being queer. We could have had a queer president. I'm just saying, we probably could have had one <laughs> and we probably can in the future as long as we like start, as, I feel like we're on a good pace, but you know, just keep going up instead of just lining, just keep it going up. I agree. Representation is super, super important. And um, just doing things like talking about like being queer if you are and like teaching like more history and stuff and like books and just like talking about queer people existing. And also things like um, just like asking for like preferred names and stuff and pronouns. So many kids like already don't feel safe at home and it's, like, it can be very, very hard to um, like go up to like your teachers and like tell them yourself. So, like, it just like a little step, even of like just like um, passing out like a form at the beginning of the school year or something, and just asking about it, so that it just it really helps, just like yeah, to help people help. Yeah, definitely. And just thinking about the future, I think really celebrating queer identity as well as the representation part is really important. And also to what Anita was saying, you know, we have a lot of intersections. And so like the queer population up here is quite white. Uh, you'll see that with our educational panel. Um, and so really we would love to see some more, you know, queer people of color because we exist as well. And we need to be represented as well in the community. So thank you student panel for your voices and perspective in this all. All right, so we are going to now move to our educator panel. And so I'm gonna ask the educators that are a part of this panel to uh, turn on your video and um, let's see, students feel free to leave your, sorry, leave your video on and join the conversation or turn it off, whichever you prefer. All right, and now we have the educators in the room. So we're gonna go around and do some quick introductions. Uh, let's see, Rosemary, would you go first? Sure, I'd love to go first. Uh, thank you, Ty. My name is Rosemary Grady. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the director of the after school program at Peninsula Union. And I'm just a little queer brown baby trying to decolonize the education system. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Yes, well, we're excited to have you here. I'll see. Tina, would you go next? Hi friends, my name is Tina West and I teach third grade at Hoopa Elementary School. I use she, her pronouns and I um, am an advisor for our Rainbow Alliance here at our school. Nice, well, thank you for joining us all the way from Hoopa. All right, Julie, would you go next? Hi everyone, I'm Julie Tyler. I use they, them pronouns and I am a third grade aid as well as an English language learner aid at Arcata Elementary. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for being here. Tess, would you go next? Yeah. Hi, my name is Tess Yinger. I'm a K-8 teacher at Peninsula Union Elementary. I'm also an instructional coach and bus driver. Nice. Thank you. And Lark. Hello. I'm Lark and I work towards intersectional liberation and inclusive belonging in Humboldt County as the superintendent principal of Peninsula Union School District, the executive director of Queer Humboldt and the transgender health champion for Open Door Clinics. Thank you for being here. And then we also have Nora who will join us for the panel um, as well. All right, so we're gonna get started with the first question for the educator panel. Can you speak to your personal experience with issues of two-spirit LGBTQ um, identity and visibility as a queer educator in Humboldt? I can speak first. Um, my, I resonate so much with some of the students about them creating a made family and having representation in the community that they created. Um, and so, 
one of my close friends, um, Mo is a um, queer black woman educator. Um, and I've learned so much through them in my other community, um, just about like being yourself completely. Um, and I'm really thankful for the community I have and um, for the uh, educators I work alongside at Peninsula Union because it's always been a super easy conversation to have. Um, and I know that that doesn't exist everywhere and everyone has very different experiences of that. And so I'm just very thankful for what I've experienced. I can go next. Um, so as a queer educator, I have been really lucky um, to be out at my school and to schools in the past and previous ones um, and have um, just a, a huge support um, from my colleagues and from my admin. Um, and while I'm really grateful for that, at the same time, I feel though that I am not, um, I can't talk, I can't be out to my students. I'm there visibly, but there's no conversation about it. Um, to verbally talk about it or to answer questions. Um, and I feel for also for some colleagues that I've had in the past, you know, it's more of like a sense of like, they just tolerate me, um, but they also sometimes use um, the wrong pronouns. They all make jokes, um, they'll make comments about my identity, about not being feminine enough or being too masculine. Um, I've also been told by colleagues that in the past that my gender or queerness is something that shouldn't be talked about or does not belong in the classroom. And to me, when that is being said, it's like, okay, so then I don't belong in the classroom then. And I feel like that's a big disservice, not only to, to you know, queer students, but to students in general, because there needs to be that representation. Um, and it does feel isolating to be uh, a trans, non-binary, queer staff member at a school when we can't have conversations about this with our students um, because we're so scared about what the parents are gonna say or how this is gonna reflect on us or if we're gonna get backlash um, you know, from anybody else um, and just having this fear. And I still feel like even though I am out to my staff, um, you know, I am still concerned about that. And you know, kids need that representation because they, they have to see, you know, the reflections that are around them in their world and stuff. And we should be able to answer their questions um, and have conversations about our identities. Um, you know, children, you know, no one's too young to learn about, you know, how to love and respect um, for diversity in our, in our world and for individuals and families in their school community. Thank you, Julie. For I'd like to share a little bit about my experience at Hoopa L. Um, I really appreciate Nora Wynn for her talk, you know, um, as a, a bisexual person, I've only learned about queer um, history as an adult and of my own accord. I've never had an experience where I had a teacher or a staff member explicitly teach about it. And like some of our student panels, I did have teachers that I was like, I wonder, or I'm curious if they're gay, but and had you know some magnetism and there. But um, my personal experience is I'm um, I'm not explicitly out at my campus. I um, I never deny my sexuality, but I don't have. I mean, I do have a rainbow flag. I was going to say I don't have a rainbow flag flying in my room, but I actually do. Um, but in any case, I'm not. Um, I, I don't present that as like the biggest forefront of my identity markers. But I did see a need in our school. I remember um, we had some junior high students expressing the need for like, hey, we need to, you know, we need to exercise and show our pride at our school. And I was like, well, hey, let's create a club. And our students came together and um, expressed what their needs were. And um, um, our students on our campus is predominantly American Indian. And so I created spaces where our students could be busy using their hands doing some beadwork, we did some rainbow um, pins and some uh, rainbow bracelets and then opened up the dialogue where we could have conversations about gender and sexuality and, and healthy relationships. And um, it was something that our students really needed to be affirmed in who they are. And, and then, you know, by me opening myself out and um, bringing myself to the forefront and then, you know, allowing for that safe space for some of our um, other staff members to, to also be out. 
So I'm learning so much here tonight as well. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'll go. I, I have felt um, working at Peninsula that we exist in a really safe bubble in a lot of ways. And I know that our experience and freedom to be out and be ourselves at work is not the experience of all educators um, in this county or even nationwide. Um, but I feel very lucky in that way to have that experience and to have an administrator that supports me in being out and being open with my students. Um, and allowing me to teach directly my, to my students about what it means to be L to S L G B T Q plus. Um, all my students know what those letters mean and they can talk to each other and talk to the, their adults about what it means. Um, I think that I've had the most fear uh, with families from time to time um, and interactions that I've had with families. Um, but as far as being supported by my colleagues, it's been, it's been very wonderful to have that support. Thanks, Tess. I think it's really important to also kind of recognize what you as well as Alex were saying in terms of safety in a bubble. Uh, I think Humboldt is really kind of marketed a certain way, especially to students, and then folks get here and realize that outside of that HSU bubble or those bubbles that we create, the community is not the same. So thank you. All right, Lark or Nora, did you wanna add anything before we move on to our next question? I guess I'll just add that, um, you know, my first years teaching here in Humboldt County, um, I had already been an out person and I felt um, I was I was counseled into be, being in the closet um, at the first school I taught at. And um, that led me to, to leave that first job because of um, the homophobia that was present on campus and because I didn't feel like um, I would be supported. And um, I felt like I was setting a really bad example for kids. I mean, I think kids read me as queer and then if I'm acting like I'm not, um, it's a bad example. And, and I felt like I couldn't live with myself doing that. So I guess I would just add that to our, our Humboldt County bubble. I think that, uh, well, so last month during the equity series, there was a teacher um, who spoke about um, people not having his back. And I, re I re resonated so much because as an out queer administrator, I'm very aware of, of who has my back and who doesn't. Um, and so it makes me really proactive about making sure that all of my staff know that I have their back. And it's what I wish I had had. My very beginning teaching job, uh, my very first day I referred to my partner and my boss immediately said, don't, don't do that. Um, call him your boyfriend. I was female presenting at the time or, or looked like a lady at the time. Um, and, and she said, don't, don't call him your partner because people might get confused and you don't want anyone to get confused um, and think that you're queer. And meanwhile, like I called him my partner because I didn't want to pass as straight. I wanted to present as queer. I was consciously using language that was accurate for me. Um, but to have my boss on like the first day tell me, you know, don't say something that someone might think means you're queer, um, really, you know, set a tone for like, wow, like, is this what it's going to be like for me in education, right? This is the person who I need to have trust that she has my back. And here she is pressuring me to be in the closet. Um, and so I've been really proactive to, to, to not be that boss. Nice, thanks. Yeah, I think it's really important to, to touch on that our identities have been policed a lot in terms of our professional lives and even erased, maybe not purposefully, but they've been erased nonetheless. All right. So the second question for our educator panel is how do you queer education? So one thing that 
comes up for me um, is uh, a lot of queer queerness has been actively erased. And so just by unerasing it, right? Like I think of like the truth as being this ink that, that was disappeared and now it's reappeared. Um, you know, there are already so many amazing queer people that people learn about in school, um, but the fact that they're queer is erased, right? Um, kids might read Anne Frank's diary, uh, but the queer content was edited out, right? We might learn about George Washington Carver. We might not learn about the man he partnered with later in life. Um, and so just by unerasing that which was actively erased, education is queered. Um, the, the reality is that we live in an incredibly diverse world and that queer people have existed internationally throughout history. And on, like right now, we live during a time where we're systemically erased from public discourse. And there's this idea that naming who we are is somehow uh, perverse, right? Like that, that um, we can't mention it around kids as though who we are and our identity and our queerness is about you know sex, sex or something something we're not supposed to make it's like no like this is about who we are it's about our unique contribution it's about our identity it's about who we love it's about how we build our families it's about things that are absolutely appropriate to talk about with any age of people because it's about love and it's about who we are and so this equation of who we are and things that need to be kind of tucked out of out of public sight um, is not is not it. So if we just stop tucking it away and welcome it into the space and are honest about the nature of reality and the diversity that is embedded in our world, that inherently queers education. Um, and right now, because of the world we live in, we have to be proactive about it. Um, but if it weren't for homophobia and transphobia and queerphobia, we wouldn't have to be proactive about it. We would just not actively erase anything. I can go next. Um, I think for me, since, you know, I feel like I can't like tell um, students who I am, I can show them who I am. I can be that queer person on campus. I have uh, my they, them, mask with my pronouns on them and yeah and students can ask like well what what is it like why do you have they then like on your mask why do you have they them on your zoom um when we, we're doing zoom and it's like well that's a teachable moment right there like those are pronouns like some people use he some people use she i use they then because you know like i'm a mix of you know man and woman like sometimes i'm neither um and i think just um really also having that representation in the school but also educating my colleagues um, about it. And I have been recently um, putting on trainings for schools, including my own, about how to create a gender inclusive campus and also have a gender positive campus as well. You know, we hear comments of saying like, oh, well, pink's a girl's color or you like you throw like a girl. It's like, you know, teaching, having moments where we're tackling those kinds of issues that affect all students. It's not just queer students, but just all students are being affected by homophobia and misogyny and transphobia. Um, so really just being visible about that without always having to, you know, be like, oh yeah, we're talking about trans issues because, you know, for some we can't, we still can't talk about that. Um, and I think just being on campus and students being aware, like, oh, well, that educator is kind of different. Like that teacher is kind of different. Like, I don't know, like, you know, but still being there. And so they can kind of like be like, okay, like be aware that there is something different, but that it's okay. Um, and my colleagues being supportive and calling me by my right pronouns and showing that this is natural, like this is normal. Like, you know, we're all accepting everybody here. Yes, thank you. I think it's really important just like when we're talking about existence as a form of resistance as well. So thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Rosemary. No, you're okay. Uh, I was just going to say I also agree with you, Julie, of just like rising up to those teachable moments and creating um, conversations and like creating those teachable moments too by just existing and being that representation. Um, like you said, no one uh, we all suffer when you know we live under the umbrella of white supremacy and transphobia and homophobia no one's liberated under that umbrella and so once we 
are able to have these conversations become more normalized where um, we can have these conversations freely and feel safely doing so and have the support needed. Um, then yeah, I think everyone wins then. Um, but yeah, I would just say the same thing about um, what I do when I uh, queer education is just being completely mindful of the intersectionality of the lives that we exist in and like those that we teach of and um, yeah, not um, restricting anyone's identity or narrative to being a single story and being something that we just visit within a month, you know, within uh, the like trans awareness or um, Black History Month, just being completely aware that these narratives need to be told throughout the year um, and that that's something that we can do, you know, every day. Um, I would just like to be really honest and super vulnerable right here that I feel like this is a skill gap that I have. And I appreciate your compassion in extending your empathy towards me, but I do, um, you know, like our fellow panelists have shared, like have really honest, unflinching conversations when it comes out, but I'm not sure in my own evaluation that I actually really do center queerness. And it is a place where I, I'm, I'm acknowledging my skill gap and making a commitment to um, grow in that area. I never deny my sexuality. If someone asks me straight up, like, is that your girlfriend, girlfriend? I'm always like, yes, that's my girlfriend. And, and my, my girlfriend is um, undeniably queer, um, but I'm very, you know, femme hetero passing and it doesn't always come up for me. And um, I'm really, just being honest that I need to step my step up my game in that realm. And I, like I said earlier, I'm learning a lot from this committee and I've had some friends to say, oh yeah, I've got these great, um, you know, picture books that I can share with you. And I'm um, going to grow my library and center queerness um, in the future. So thank you for letting me be honest and vulnerable in that way. Thank you for that, Tina. I really appreciate that. And I think it's good for everyone, just like we're all on our journey of, you know, this, as well as we're in the journey separately, as well as together. And so we can definitely learn from each other as well as, you know, grow ourselves. So thank you. I would add to, um, to just one tiny bit that that may help Tina in my um, in my class that I teach the um, the gay and lesbian issues in K twelve schools class. Many of these fine panelists students um, are creating lessons for K twelve schools that are standards based, and they are always looking for partner teachers. And so, if you are available, Alex and Romel and Anita and many other students are, are right now creating lessons and they are reaching out to teachers and saying, you know, does this seem like a lesson that you would teach? Does it seem like it goes with your standards? Is it age appropriate? And the, and the cooperating teachers are giving them feedback and some of those teachers are here tonight and I thank you, all these great folks in the community who are, who are giving my students feedback and I think it's helping them grow as well. I think I've had teachers write back to me and say, oh my gosh, this is the best lesson. I'm gonna use this lesson. And, um, and of course I can't take credit. The students themselves made these great lessons. They did the research, they looked up the standards. And so um, I would say that's one way that I'm trying to help queer education, like Lark said, like on erasing the parts that have been you know, omitted uh, and, and omission is, is a deep cut as well. So. Uh, Tina, if you're looking for um, some great college student to, to help you write a lesson, they're here for you. Nice. Well, I love the, the connections and community building that's happening right now. Even in a Zoom space, it's possible. All right. Um, so I just, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Tess. I was just going to say that I wanted to add um, that I think it's really important that we develop our lens to see what perspectives are being left out in our curriculum. Um, and so not just like encouraging teachers to do that, but also encouraging your students to do that. So asking your students whose perspective is this and whose perspective is being left out in this story and just having that be an ongoing conversation. Um, and that 
applies to queer, the queer identity, but also racialized identities, um, classist identities, like across the spectrum, that intersectionality piece is really important there too. Um, so one way that I have the privilege of, of um, showing up in education as a queer educator is being really out and proud at my school. Um, and I think that too, um, is really important as a way to develop that lens and just like go to school every day being brave and being out and having those conversations with kids um, and not omitting that because I think when you omit that that also speaks volumes when you omit that part of yourself and you don't share that with kids that says a lot all right well I'm loving this conversation but unfortunately we are kind of running out of time. So we're going to go to our last question. Uh, what is it that you wish was in place to support Two-Spirit LGBTQIA plus educators, staff, as well as students? I wish that these conversations were more normalized, that when we have conversations about the gender spectrum or uh, different sexualities or just different family structures that like we as educators aren't pushing an agenda that we're not like making your kids gay by like creating these conversations and dialogue. I just wish it was more normalized. Um, and yeah, like uh, Nora said earlier, that was more celebrated that like there wasn't fear around coming out or um, yeah, just being who you are and um, being able to be that um, in a safe space. I also I think, think, oh, sorry. Oops. Okay. <laughs> I just, I think that it's also really important that non-queer and cisgender educators step up and be good allies. And that means that you actually take steps to advocate for your queer colleagues, your trans colleagues, and also your queer students and your trans students. So not just like colluding with that system of oppression, right? But really taking a chance, taking a risk and being a real ally yeah, I think what we really need um, from our allies is to really step up and educate yourselves, um, keep learning like you are attending now um, at this on this Zoom, um, and also speaking up. You know, if we're if we're not in the room, um, still correct. You know, using the correct pronouns. Um, you know, standing up for us. I think also for schools in general to reshape the way that we practice and teach because. Um, we are teaching a binary where there's just man or woman or that you're just straight um, and having more gender neutral language, having language in general. I didn't have language growing up uh, in the 90s. I didn't know what, you know, gay or trans was. And having those words are really powerful because not only to help, you know, future queer kids, um, but to also establish empathy for the rest of our the rest of our students in our schools and also really teaching our history and our contributions as queer people. Uh, because we're not going to be, you know, the last queer educators in our school. There are going to be, with more visibility, more um, teachers coming out, more students that are going to be coming out, and they're going to be coming out at younger ages now. Um, so to be really mindful and to be open-minded and to really listen um, to your um, staff member or your students who are queer. Um, and yeah, thank you. I have a couple of ideas. Uh, one, it comes from a school district where I worked, where we had LGBTQ family night. Every October, there'd be a night. It would be in the gym. There would be cheese and crackers and fizzy non-alcoholic beverage. And LGBTQ students and queer families and queer teachers, and anyone who's part of that school community who is part of the LGBTQ plus community could come together and meet each other. Because a lot of times, we might not recognize each other as much as we think we always will. Uh, we very well might miss it, um, but giving us that opportunity to come together, to socialize, to build relationships, to, to be visible at least to one another in a way that we can form meaningful bonds. There's a lot of power in that. And you can be a, a small, medium, large school and do something like that, and it can have incredible impact. Um, I know when I went to HSU freshman year, they had something like that up at the Cape Buchanan room. And I went and it was amazing. And it was so powerful to realize like, 
okay, like it's not just the people that I notice, it's also all of these people. Um, and the second one, it's an idea I've been pitching for five years. I'm gonna keep on pitching it. I think it'd be really cool if HCOE hosted a, a professional learning community for LGBTQ educators and allies to come together once a month and support each other countywide because you know one school can do it or one individual at a school might be doing it, but there is nothing like coming together from different schools, from different cultures and supporting each other and cross-pollinating ideas and building allegiances and resources um, and then doing, doing training together, right? And then bringing that learning back to our individual schools and communities to move it forward. And I think that would make a huge difference. Uh, and, and those are my two ideas. I have a bunch of others, but those are two. Yeah, I love all of those ideas. And um, I was thinking of saying along the same lines as my friend Lark, um, creating um, some education. Cause I feel like we have um, well-intended individuals but they may not have the vocabulary or the skill set to bring it forward. And um, it needs to be kind of ongoing professional development where we have an opportunity to have these conversations bring it um, in the forefront and then actually have an opportunity to practice, right? Cause you know, we're not, some folks are struggling with they, them pronouns or understanding or even just understanding pronoun issues. I know in our district, we just was, uh, email was circulated around pronouns. Um, and there was quite a bit of like, well, why do we even need to do this? And it's like, well, there's a, a whole need for that. And it's a, it's a conversation that, that needs to be ongoing. So professional development and an opportunity for folks to practice. So I love your idea, let's do it. Oh, I have one more idea that I, I want to throw out there. Um, and that is about professional development. A lot of times teachers get professional development but our classified staff isn't always included in those. And I really think it's important that we prioritize supporting our classified staff in understanding LGBTQ topics as they impact schools. Um, teachers might hear students say homophobic things, but classified employees are way more likely to hear it because um, kids behave differently in different contexts. And so making sure that we're really empowering all of our, our school community members and having the, the skills for interrupting bias, answering questions, Sometimes kids might be afraid to ask their teacher a question, you know, but they'll ask the yard monitor. And so making sure that we're including the, everyone in, in that learning so that everyone is equipped to handle things in the moment and maximize those teachable moments that Julie was referencing. Nice. Well, did any other panelists want to make any final comments before we wrap up this amazing event? All right, cool. Well, um, so kind of to wrap things up, I also wanted to put a little list of some of the resources that are in Humboldt right now um, that you can utilize to get more information. Uh, so I'm going to drop this, let's see, ooh, this document in the chat. So this is actually created by Ryan uh, Keller, who is a librarian at HCOE. And it is an amazing list of LGBT children's literature that is available um, at HCOE, as well as like some, some little info about them. And they are by age. So if that's something that interests you. As well as, let's see if I can do this. Uh, Queer Humble is actually a great organization and we are currently working on a resource list. So stay tuned for that. We also offer um, trainings and uh, basically trainings for staff members of a lot of different types of organizations, depending on where you are and what you want. Um, just drop the HCOE children's literature list. The Eric Rofus Multicultural Queer Resource Center is a great resource for folks that are attending HSU as well as the community. Uh, they put on a lot of queer events as well as um, support groups of sorts. Uh, Sisters, of oh my God. Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence as well as Open Doors Trans Health Services are some great resources in the area. 
And now I'm going to turn it over to Stacy to talk about the roadmap for our future sessions. Thank you, Ty. What an incredible evening that you've facilitated. We, can we say thank you also to Ty for all their hard work? Um, so the next two events we have are both in May. Uh, the first one is May 13th, and it is a night of information and inspiration about college, and it will be in Spanish with HSU World Language Professors and students from El Centro, the Latinx Center for Academic Excellence. And then Thursday, May 27th, uh, Can Humboldt Schools Be Good Medicine with Dr. Kutcher Rissling Baldi and Dr. Virgil Moorhead as our keynotes. And I will send you links. If you've been registered for this event, you will get links for all of tonight's resources in addition to uh, registration links for those events. All right. And so Stacy is also going to uh, pop in the chat a link to the survey if you have some time. Please fill it out so we know what you think of the event, what we might be able to do differently. Um, and so we would love your feedback in that. And if you have any questions or if you want more information about HCOE and their equity series, you can always contact Monica Rivera or Stacy Young, um, as well as there's information on their actual website as well. And look at that, 631, right on time. So thank you, everyone. I really want to especially thank our panels and Nora um, for giving us their perspective and their time tonight. And thank you all for being here.